Pensacola's association with naval aviation dates back to 1914 and the creation of the country's first naval air station. And in this episode of Naval Legends, we'll be tracing over the development of the air arm of the US Navy. In 1910, one of the aviation pioneers, Glenn Curtis, supported by U.S. Navy, prepared an ambitious experiment. It included cruiser USS Birmingham and an aircraft constructed by Curtis and piloted by Eugene Ely, a test pilot. As he strapped himself into his Curtis Hudson Flyer aboard the light cruiser USS Birmingham on the 14th of November 1910, Eugene Ely, then 24 years of age, could hardly have known that he was partaking in the birth of one of the most powerful weapon systems of the 20th century. Only a few minutes later, he'd make history as the first man to ever launch an aircraft from the deck of a ship. Two months later, in January 1911, Curtis, Ely, and U.S. Navy carried out another demonstration in the San Francisco Bay, where cruiser USS Pennsylvania with a flight deck on her was moored. Ely flew from the Presidio, which is an army fort in San Francisco, about 15 miles down the bay, and landed on the flight deck, which had been equipped with about 20 manila ropes uh, with sea bags at the end of the, ro at the, end of the, of the uh, ropes. The airplane had a grappling hook underneath it, and he, when he touched down on the flight deck, the grappling hook caught five of the wires. He stopped in about 30 feet, and that was the first landing of an aircraft on a ship at sea. Aircraft specifications for Curtis Pusher, model D4. Length, almost eight meters. Wingspan, more than 10 meters. Takeoff weight, 590 kilograms. Engine, Curtis. Power, 40 HP. Maximum speed, 80 kilometers per hour. Crew, one person. Despite the obvious success of Curtis's experiments, the idea of specialized aircraft carrying ships did not come to fruition for a very long time in the USA. The high command of the US Navy treated airplanes as auxiliary equipment of a warship. Admirals believed that aircraft could not become a fully-fledged strike force for the fleet. They were restricted to reconnaissance and artillery spotting missions, and they were mostly seaplanes. World War I spurred the progress of the US naval aviation to some extent, but it was aimed mostly at the increase in number of seaplanes. When we entered World War I in April 1917, we had no carriers at this time yet, but we, were, we had many, many flying boats. And when, when the World War I ended in November 1918, we had over 200 twin-engine Curtis flying boats flying combat. So the first submarine ever sunk by a uh, aircraft was sunk by a Curtis H-16 flying boat in 1918. During World War I, aircraft began to change shape and form. Gone were the fragile-looking open trusses with webs of bracing wire. Replacing them came more modern biplanes with continuous skin covering on a fuselage, more powerful engines, and more powerful armament. Case in point, this VE-7 Bluebird. VE-7 was to become the US Navy's first carrier-launched fighter. Aircraft specifications for VE-7 Bluebird. Length. 7.5 meters, wingspan, 10.5 meters, takeoff weight, 879 kilograms, engine, right Hispano E3, power, 180 HP, maximum speed, 171 kilometers per hour, service ceiling, 4,500 meters, armament, one or two machine guns, caliber 7.62 millimeter, crew, one person. At the end of World War I, when the British built their first true aircraft carrier with a flight deck stretching from aft to bow, everyone understood that planes would be an integral part of future naval fleets. That's why in 1920, the US Navy refitted its old collier, USS Jupiter, removed a part of its superstructure and constructed a 160 meter long flight deck on her. Renamed USS Langley, the ship was commissioned in 1922 and became the first aircraft carrier of the US Navy. Initially, Langley served as an experimental platform where the basis for battle application of deck aircraft was laid down 
and a new school of shipbuilding was created. Taking off was not an issue. Uh, we didn't use a catapult in those days. The, the planes were able to take off on the flight deck, but the landing was the issue. So initially, not only did they have the, the arresting wires that go across the flight deck, like you see on modern carriers, uh, they also had cables that ran perpendicular with the flight deck. In other words, fore and aft. They had a hook, a tail hook, and you also had what looked like an anchor or several anchors, little small anchors on a rod between the main wheels, and they hooked into the fore and aft wires. So it's kind of a spider web nightmare. Uh, after about a year, we realized that we did not need the fore and aft wires, so we just went with the cross deck wires, and uh, it worked out fine. In the autumn of 1920, the deputy commander of the US Air Force, Brigadier General Mitchell, declared that aviation can destroy, disable, and sink any existing warship, as well as any other built in future. Next year, in the summer, tests were conducted. They showed that aircraft is quite capable of sinking even a battleship by dropping a sufficient number of powerful bombs on it. The results of these tests led the Navy to the conclusion that their ships needed reinforced anti-aircraft defenses and thicker horizontal armor. Advocates of naval aviation were already imagining squadrons of deck aircraft sinking enemy ships. All they needed was to modernize airplanes and develop a bomb-dropping technique. In the mid-1920s, Curtis presented to the Navy their design for a land-based fighter, the F-6C. It had a powerful engine, and had great maneuverability and speed, as befitted Curtis's legacy for making maneuverable sports aircraft and breaking speed records. It even came with an auxiliary fuel tank as an option. The aircraft was famous for being one of the first to try dive bombing as a technique. And the aircraft entered service, particularly taking part in Lexington's commissioning ceremony as part of her air wing. Aircraft specifications for F6C Hawk. Length, almost seven meters. Wingspan, 11.5 meters. Takeoff weight, 1,238 kilograms. Engine, Pratt & Whitney R13403 Wasp. Power, 410 HP. Maximum speed, 255 kilometers per hour. Service ceiling, 7,000 meters. Armament, two Browning machine guns, caliber 7.62 millimeter. Two bombs weighing 52.6 kilograms. Crew, one person. The F-6C had uh, its biggest problem was that it had a, a water jacket around it. It was built kind of like a car, the engine was, called an inline engine. Uh, it was a better looking airplane, but if warplanes get shot at and a water jacket around, just like on your car, you put one bullet in that water jacket, the water's gonna go out and the plane is gonna stop. So it was not a successful airplane. F-7C that followed it was, they used the, uh, what they called jugs, separate individual cylinders. So the advantages to that for the Navy, uh, as opposed to a liquid-cooled engine, uh, was that you eliminated the entire cooling system, which involved a radiator, water lines, some sort of cooling scoop or vent or something for the radiator, uh, and you also eliminated a massive amount of maintenance. After the F-7C in the late 20s, uh, every Navy operational fighter, uh, reciprocating fighter, had a radial engine that operated off a carrier. Everyone knows this associates Boeing with airliners, but Boeing was a, back in the 20s was a, a very big supplier of fighters to the Navy. Uh, they had the one particular line of fighters, the F-4B fighters. Uh, which uh, the last version came out in 1932, the F-4B-4. Aircraft specifications for F-4B. Length, 6.2 meters. Wingspan, more than nine meters. Takeoff weight, 1,323 kilograms. Engine, Pratt & Whitney R1340E Wasp. Power, 550 HP. Maximum speed, 301 kilometers per hour. Service ceiling, 8,400 meters. Armament, two Browning machine guns, caliber 
7.62 mm. In the bomber variant, the aircraft could carry up to 227 kilograms of bombs. Crew, one person. Especially in the, in the uh, 20s, uh, when their aviation uh, advancements were, were happening at a very high rate, it, aerodynamics, engines, airframes, there was a lot of competition amongst the manufacturers uh, because people were making better airplanes every year. So uh, someone would turn out a very good fighter, a year later somebody would turn out an even better fighter. In the early 1930s, the Bureau of Aeronautics, the organization responsible for the development and acquisition of naval aircraft and its associated materiel, allegedly asked Grumman to design a retractable gear system for the Boeing F-4B4. Well, Grumman's engineers had patented their design and weren't inclined to share it with somebody else. Besides, they said, you couldn't actually fit a retractable system to the Boeing aircraft. Only a month later, however, they developed and presented to the Navy a new two-seat fighter aircraft. Coincidentally, the Navy had only recently issued a requirement for a new series of fighter aircraft. The Grumman FF-1, sometimes known as the Goblin, met all these requirements. The FF-1 was revolutionary. A derelament skin, enclosed cockpit, and of course, retractable gear. In 1933, 25 of these aircraft formed the air group for the carrier Lexington. Aircraft specifications for FF-1 Goblin. Length, 7.5 meters. Wingspan, 10.5 meters. Takeoff weight, 2,111 kilograms. Engine, Wright R182078. Power, 700 HP. Maximum speed, 323 kilometers per hour. Service ceiling, 6,700 meters. Armament, three Browning machine guns, caliber 7.62 millimeter. Two bombs weighing 52.6 kilograms. Crew, two persons. This is the only one in the world, the one that we have. We found it in a junkyard down in Nicaragua. As a matter of fact, Navy pilot found it down there. It's crop dusting down there several decades back now. And he called the Navy, and, or he called the uh, Grumman people, and they said, we'll be right down. Eight years later, it came up here to the museum. They flew it into the museum. One of the few that's been flown into the museum. Most of these airplanes come in pieces, and we put them together here. The Great Depression of 1929 ruined many enterprises and almost destroyed the Curtis Company, which had been supplying the Army and the Navy with cutting-edge aircraft throughout the course of the 1920s. However, Curtis survived and in 1933 followed Grumman in constructing an airplane with retractable chassis and duralumin skin. The Navy planned to put the new Curtis aircraft into service aboard a freshly built carrier that was launched the same year. However, its fighter wing had been already completed and the command decided to repurpose the new Curtis plane as a bomber with the BF-2C-1 designation. Curtis's engineers networked their design according to its new specialization and installed additional gear for bomb suspension. It was one of the early dive bombers again. They started trying to dive bomb but by just putting a bomb on the fuselage. A bomb has better aerodynamics than an airplane, so the bomb would accelerate when you first, you're first you going into this 60, 70, 80 degrees nose down. The bomb would accelerate and go into the propeller. And what, what they did was they had this trapeze-like outfit uh, under undercarriage that would swing out and allow the bomb to clear the propeller. In the 1930s, the biplane began to give way to the monoplane and the US Navy did not feel like being left behind in these advancements. It was at this point that Grumman presented to the Navy their new fighter designed for a monoplane, the F4F3. Now the Navy already had the Buffalo, but the Grumman design intrigued them. Firstly, it was very fast. The prototype in trials hit a speed of 287 knots. 
It was highly maneuverable. It had a powerful armament of four caliber 50 Browning machine guns. And the pilot sat high. The nose had an eight degree downward slope, which meant that the pilot could then keep visual contact with the target, even at high angles of lead. After a number of modifications to the prototype, the Navy ordered it into series production. Aircraft specifications for F4F3 Wildcat. Length, almost nine meters. Wingspan, 11.5 meters. Takeoff weight, 3,367 kilogram. Engine, Pratt & Whitney R183076. Power, 1,200 HP. Maximum speed, 533 kilometers per hour. Service ceiling, 9,950 meters. Armament. Four Browning machine guns, caliber 12.7 millimeter. The aircraft could carry two 50 kilogram bombs. Crew, one person. The design was so successful that both the British and French became interested in the aircraft. As a result, the Wildcat was put into service by the Royal Navy earlier than in the US Navy. Now, one of the rather uh, sort of uh, obsolete features of the Wildcat was it did have retracting landing gear. That was the good news, but the bad news was the pilot had to crank the gear up by hand. So when you launched off the carrier, you spent the first minute airborne cranking the landing gear up. So that kind of, uh, you couldn't form up or do much anything but get the gear up. So that was a little, little, uh, little hard to deal with. But of course the advantage to that was there was no hydraulic system to shoot out. So, so by cranking the gear up, you eliminated the system. By the end of the 1930s, the U.S. deck aviation had grown quite big muscles. The Navy had seven aircraft carriers in active service, and several more were being constructed. Airplane designers supplied the American fleet with the updated modern aircraft almost every year. In the 1920s and 30s, the U.S. Navy carried out a number of exercises which demonstrated an enormous potential of strike air groups. In 1938, squadrons from the carrier USS Saratoga conducted a successful training attack on the naval base at Pearl Harbor. But considering that the American fleet was stationed in California at that time, the results of this operation didn't draw too much attention. Nothing interesting, just another exercise. 